you don't have enough money to make these dumb decisions that you're making right now. This is the first thing I would do if I were you. Go look at what everyone's doing and if they don't contribute to shipping packages out or making you money, they need to go right now. You're bleeding too fast yeah. to be able to, to support this. So that was the first thing, the first decision that we had to make. And that was a tough one. But if I don't make this decision, then the business is not gonna be able to move forward any longer. All right, y'all, welcome back to the channel. I'm Marlon Wise, co owner and CEO of World and Vision. Hey, I'm Nicholas Clark, co owner and designer of World and Vision. And y'all know we back with another special episode with Justin P. All right, hey, we about to drop gems, but before we get started, I need y'all to make sure y'all like this channel, subscribe, run us up. 90K will be approaching, all right? We're gonna be getting that faster than ever. We almost at 100K, so I just want, hey, I need everybody to give themselves a round of applause for sticking with us, for being here. Woo, 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 woo. Let's get it. All right, but what you got for him, nigga? Hey, look, bro, this this one right here is about to be crazy. All right, y'all didn't, didn't probably seen this man all over your timeline, all right? But look, we not even go, I'm, I'm not gonna take his, his, his show. I'm not gonna take his shine. We gonna let him introduce himself to the channel. So if y'all don't know Justin, Justin, can you can mm -hmm. you let our channel know who you are? One million percent. First of all, always a pleasure every single time. Y'all are friends and family, so always a pleasure to be here and to talk with y'all. Justin P, I help people start or scale their e-com business, digital and physical, and that's it, man. Hey, <laughs> like, yeah, hey, I don't know hey, how let, hey, let's get it. Hey, let's get and it. Um, at least because I know everybody are familiar with you, but mm. um, at least just walk them through your journey on like, you know, where you started from sure. to like, how you were even in this seat right now. Today. Yeah, so pretty much everything started with uh, going to high school, graduating, and I went to a HBCU. Didn't know what a HBCU was, was getting my hair cut. Obviously that was a long time ago because <laughs> hair is super long now. And it wasn't even my actual barber, it was my replacement barber. You know, you walk in and then buddy in the corner like, Hey, I'll cut you up, young blood. And I'm like, I don't even know. <laughs> like, you're not even my guy for real. So, but my guy wasn't there. Sat down with him. He said, What schools you get accepted to? It was uh Howard University, Baylor University, and University of North Texas. He said, whichever one is not in Texas, go there. And I was like, cool. I went to visit Howard. When I went there, it was Fried Chicken Friday in the in the cafeteria. And bro, they had a DJ in there. And I was like, this is where I need to be at. <laughs> so I, it just astonished me of like how I didn't know about this at all when I was the first person in my family to go to college. Yep. I had no clue what was going on. So then I was like, this needs this message needs to be spread. And mm -hmm. that's when me and uh, my business partner met in college. Mm -hmm. And then he started a business called Support Black Colleges. I was just a friend. I was in the first photo shoot, video shoot, mm -hmm. just trying to support. And then that turned into me graduating and then him, him being like, hey, I know that you have a specialty in digital marketing, strategy, et cetera. Come help me out with this and let's take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And they were doing, I want to say like somewhere between 1500 a month, couple of maybe, maybe 10,000, somewhere around there. And then I jumped into the business in 2018 and then we took it up to, you know, multiple, some multiple seven figures. Mm -hmm. um, and then now I, teach people how to do that as well. That's what's up. Yeah. And like it's special right now because a lot of the times we don't also get the chance to talk to million dollar brand owners. But so right now, this is- There's a million you know, dollar one, video, right? <laughs> Multi-million dollar One of those few episodes when we do have, you know, another, uh, you know, multi-million dollar brand owner has ran a multi-million dollar brand and understands, you know, the same things that we understand. Right. So like, honestly, like what's been, you know, <laughs> one of those, What's one of those hardships? Like everybody watching this, they're like, I want that million dollar yeah. brand. Yeah. But like, what's the reality of what a million dollar brand come with? The reality of it is, if you want to run a million dollar brand or business, is that you have to be a very different person from who you are when you first started. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of people can make that journey of transitioning their ego or noticing the lack of skills that they have because. The one thing that took us from, you know, a hundred thousand a month to a million dollars in a month was like I had to very much so realize that I wasn't the right person to run the operations of this business. Mm. Now, most people would be like, no, I'm gonna do it because I said so and this is my business, my company, but then you end up, you know, lacking because the business is suffering because you have too big of an ego. Yeah. So the big realization was is that you don't have to do everything in the business. You really should just only do what you're good at and then outsource oh, everything that you're bad at and then get good at those things that you're bad at by just having the best people at it around you. And then that was a big realization for me. So I don't know, I guess, yeah. That's what's up, Nick, what you got? It, like, like really, I know, I know you hear this a lot because we, we both help 
people scale their brand, right? right? And it's not cheap. So if, if y'all watching this, it's not cheap for none of us to help you scale your brand <laughs> to a million dollar company. Right. But what we hear all the time is, uh, I don't have the money. Yeah. All right. We all didn't have the money. <laughs> right. All right. I, I, I remember you posting something. It was like, I had two pennies in my, I don't, I don't yeah, know yeah. how much it was specifically, yeah. but we all didn't have no money. I right. come from the Seven Water New Orleans, Marlin, same thing. Yeah. We all started with zero dollars. Yeah. I remember when I thought a thousand dollars was a lot of money, Right. let alone <laughs> having 10,000. You right. know what I mean? So like, can you give some advice to the people? Yeah. That just always say, I don't have the money right now. Yeah. So whenever people say that, that's always a clear sign to me is that you really do need like mentorship, coaching or something along those lines. When I first got started, I saved up $10,000 just from hustling and then on my job that I had. Mm -hmm. And then I invested all of it into inventory. So like that just lets you know where my mind was at. I was all the way in the wrong place. Then from there, I'm like, how am I going to sell all this inventory that I just got? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right. Then I was like, I don't have any money. So what am I supposed to do? Because I just invested it all in inventory and I don't have no platform, no following, no content, no nothing. And then I'm like, all right, I need to go into my closet, take my Balenciagas, my Gucci, my Margiela, because we invest a lot of money on our body rather than inside of it. So I took all of that stuff, sold it all, and then I invested in a $100 coaching call. And then that hundred dollar coaching call taught me Facebook ads from someone that I watched on YouTube, much like many people watch y'all on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then that hundred dollars turned into me immediately getting a forex return on my ad spend. And I was like, damn, I, I told myself this. I'm gonna start asking myself a better question because most people are saying I don't have money. And then what does it cost? What is the cost of this price program? Whatever. I asked myself, what does it cost me not to do it? Because if I would have not made that hundred dollar investment, it would have cost me everything that I have today. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a better mindset and frame to have when you're coming into someone saying, oh, I don't have money. It's like, well, number one, it don't take money to make money. It just takes resourcefulness. So if you can be resourceful because we all know people that's like us, maybe your family wasn't there. Your mom didn't help you out. You grew up in the system. You came from the bad side in the hood, but you still made it out some way. It wasn't because you had the money. It's because you had something that most people don't have, which is resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. So I would say, number one, you got to be resourceful. Number two, you got to realize that it don't take money to make money. And then number three is that if that's your excuse, then that is one of the biggest reasons for you to seek out a way to find the money to be able to get the coaching and that you need. Like mm -hmm. simple as that. Because another thing that people do is like, oh, I don't have the time. And I'm like, well, guess why you don't have the time? It's because you're using all of your time doing the wrong stuff. Yep. So if you come and get with someone that can help you see the right things to do, you're going to one, stop doing all the wrong stuff, which gets you more time back. And then two, do all of the right stuff, which allows your time to be much more maximized. So long winded answer to hopefully answer the Man, question. I, <laughs> now, I, I, heard, I, heard you, I heard you say this. I don't know if it was on like a call or if it was on like a video. It was like, you was like, make this the last time that yeah. you tell yourself that you don't have it. Yeah. Cause like the more that you continue, like, like we always tell people, you hang around people that don't, that can't pay, guess what you're going to become? The person that can't pay. Right. So like, like I'm, I'm starting to really just be real with people and just say, man, make this the last time not having it. Because at the end of the day, we did the same thing that you said. Like, I like what you said about investing that hundred dollars into that coaching call because we always see even your mentor need a mentor like yeah. we always learning it, no, it don't stop from you know us just building a multi-million dollar brand and we just all right that's it right now nah, we trying to see how we could get to that hundred million dollar yeah. you know what i mean and that always require other people that's bigger than us mm -hmm. you know to, to be able to get that i seen you in the room at the end of last year that like we paid five thousand right. dollars to get in right. you know what i mean for three days only and i yeah. felt like I felt like I was the smallest person in the room. Uh, you get what I mean? Yeah. And most of the rooms that we go in, people may think that we the biggest. Right. But then when I invested that 5K for that three day event, mm. I'm like, damn, like I really got some things we got to really work on it from. Right. Yeah, that's when we really started to, like these last six months, seven months, like we started to just go crazy. Yeah. Bro. So like, I like how you said that you invested into your own education because at the end of the day, we, we wouldn't be able to be right here right now. And I hope, you know, this resonate with you too, mm -hmm. because because of we had we got the information to be able to get to where we are now. You know, even Myron says it all the time. It's like a coach that doesn't have a coach doesn't deserve to be a coach. Number right one, up. he's really good. And then another <laughs> thing that I heard from my boy uh, Marcus, he was like, you know, one, if you're not growing, you're dying. And then number two, he was like, 
you have to invest forward and then teach backwards. Mm -hmm. So he was like, because if you never continue to invest forward, you're not acquiring more knowledge to even teach to the people that are coming after you. Mm -hmm. So you'll be you'll stop at the level that you're willing to invest at. So he's just like, I'm always investing so I can continue learning more so that I can teach the people that are coming behind me. Because if I ever stop investing in myself, I'm going to be stopping myself at I can only teach up to this level. And I mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting. Hey man, I hope y'all getting these gems right now. All right, I, I don't even think we didn't got far in the video, and we already going crazy million dollar information right here. Hey, we we go we going up we going up with this one right got now. And I got a I got another big one um, that's like just relating like the, to the the financials mm -hmm. because like we invested like we we wanted this look like we was going crazy and. Uh, our goal is to build a warehouse. Well, we still gonna build a warehouse. Right. It's still gonna happen. May not be at the time that we have right. it in our plans and maybe at a better time. But uh, overall, like we put $150,000 into just the plans of that warehouse. Crazy. That's, that's still not here today. Wow. Um, all because of what we wanted the look of the brand to be instead of, you know, the look could have still been us doubling down on more merchandise. Right. Mm -hmm. And we could have turned that 150 into 300 or 600 right. or whatever it was. And then at that point, we could still be like, okay, now we could think about it. So, like, being 24 years old, you know, having, you know, 200, $300,000 in your account and being able to do these things, like, and it not being a smart investment. Like, yeah. Uh, and, 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 like, we're having that. We see in our reports, so it's not like we we not understanding what's going on yeah. in our company, but still not having that you know financial intelligence to make the right decisions. Like, yeah. Can we like? Because that was one of like that For was sure. like, that, like basically we we still recovering from to, yeah. from from those decisions today because you could still like you know prohibit your brand from growing. And what I'm getting to is when you small, a lot of brands they not doubling down, so they yeah. see themselves make. All right, ten thousand dollars, so and then they think that that's you know a lot of money, and they ain't even put the money back into merchandise. They didn't right. already spent a little bit over here, mm -hmm. and now they're wondering like, dang, why my brand not growing? Right. Everybody got a new car, they got a new wheel. <laughs> it's so big. There's a lot of points there. Those are really good, bro. By the way, so you know, first thing is is like when you say people have to understand when you're making these decisions. It's much easier to make a drastic decision when you're a lot smaller than when you get a lot bigger. Because mm -hmm. you're talking about, you know, I got 200,000, 300,000, whatever. Most of these brands, I look at them as like, you know, they're like tugboats. So it's like when I'm a small tugboat, I can change the direction of where I wanna go and it's easy to switch. Yeah. But when I'm like a bigger ship, like the Titanic, like it's very difficult for me to turn because I got so much going on. So, you know, just to kind of hit on what you're saying, when you, it's so difficult when you make those decisions, bro, because even we made decisions like, um, I've never even talked about this before, but like when we did the uh, HBCU virtual homecoming, investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into this virtual homecoming during uh, during COVID and even borrowing money to make it happen because we had sponsors and then they cut out and then we had to go put up our own money to do it, mm -hmm. thinking that we were gonna get a crazy return, that not happening. And then you still gotta live with the, you know, what you got going on. And then you might have to make other decisions that you didn't wanna have to make because what you saw for yourself at first didn't end up happening and then you had to make up for it. Mm -hmm. So the big the big thing here that, that I'm, I think that you're trying to get out of me in general is like when you're small, the best thing to do is just to double, triple, quadruple down on what you're good at already and what at least got you a little bit of success because this is what a lot of companies do. They get successful with hoodies, t-shirts, and hats or something. And then they're like, yo, bro, I got this crazy idea for these sneakers <laughs> and for these do-rags and for this like whatever. And then they want to invest a ton of their capital into doing that. But you haven't done any market research. You haven't surveyed your customers. You haven't done anything to prove that this is an idea even worth having. And then you invest a ton of your company and money into it. And then if it doesn't work out, you're left struggling, holding a bag, and then now you might go out of business just because you made that irrational decision. And one of the things that my mentor has told me, because while I was in this difficult place of making these hard decisions that you're talking about, um, we realized that we just had too many SKUs, you know, too many products. And he was like, Justin, I consult for Coach, Steve Madden, these big brands. He said, Coach, had six bags until they hit a billion dollars in sales. Mm. Why do you have four or 500 products? It makes no sense. You don't even know which products are bringing the most revenue. So why don't we just go look at 
80% of your sales is coming from 20% of your products and cut the 80% that isn't there and then double down all of your resources on making this work even better. And most brand owners, they just are just so busy chasing the new that they never really get good at what got them that first win that they got in general anyways. Mm. Hey, you think we could charge for this video? We're gonna have to. I got, I, got, I, got, I, got some, I got more. I got high. This, this high level right here, especially, yeah. like I said, is a great opportunity because we don't get to have, you know, just the same people that actually been in those same right. trenches. We mm -hmm. have people that's, you know, we all inspiring to be there. But like actually, you know, having a team. All right, I'm sorry I gotta interrupt this video, but if you haven't checked out our monthly workshop, you are literally missing out. We have transformed over 500 brands and minds inside of this three-day workshop. On day one, we're gonna be covering design. We're gonna be giving you our design process to take your designs to the next level. On day two, we're gonna cover marketing. So we're gonna show you how to set up and run Facebook ads. We're gonna show you how to create content. And on day three, we're gonna give you the scale up. We're gonna give you the play on how to set up your pop-up shops, how to set up your distribution to do over $10,000 a month. You don't want to miss this. If you're ready to continue to scale your brand, literally all I need you to do is click the link in the description. It won't take long. And we'll go ahead and see you in that workshop. Let's get back into the video. Hey, that's what you're getting into my next question. Like, what's the reality? Now you're running your brand. You're making a, a 100K a month. Like, sure. now you got a team. Like, right. what's some of those? What's the benefits of having a team? Right. And what's some of the, you know, the struggles that come with yeah. having a team? Benefits of having a team is obviously that you can delegate some of the tasks that you shouldn't be doing. If I'm a brand new brand owner, first thing that I'm trying to get rid of is just minimum wage activities. Can I get someone to help with shipping? Can I get someone to help with customer service, et cetera? The downfall of it is that now you have a new skill that you need to unlock because most people, even myself, I didn't know how to manage people at all. So I'm realizing that I'm asking this person to help me and do something. I haven't want, I haven't won told them how I want it done. Number two, told them the frequency that I want it done. And number three, showed them a way to report it to me so that I can document what they're doing and then give them a, a SOP of something of how to do this thing properly. So I'm sitting here as the business owner thinking, this person isn't giving 100% of into my business. And then I haven't even given them the pathway to be able to do it correctly. Mm. So I think number one for, for new brand owners in general is understanding that delegating is mandatory but you have to learn the skill of doing it properly. The pros of having a team is that you do have people that can help you. The cons of it is that you have to become a whole different person to manage these people. And I think that, um, I think that just this, this conversation in general too, is like, what I like to look at is a few things when I'm even you know hiring people, I like to build questions based around like our core value, values. So like for me, it's like, competency because a lot of people will come in and say, oh, I have, you know, I can do X, Y, and Z for you. I like to ask a question of like, hey, we're looking to hire a designer. If I'm talking to Nick, hey, look, we're looking to hire a designer. This is the exact problem that I have right now. How would you solve it if you came to work for us tomorrow? That just exercises, you have the competency to do so. Number two is the willingness to go the extra mile. When we have 14,000 orders and a bunch of, um, or like we have 14,000 orders to do, and we needed extra help. I did it myself just to make sure that everyone knew that we was willing to do it. So are you willing to do that as well? So I asked a question like this, hey, we get a lot of inquiries. You know, Sometimes they come in about 4.55, 4.56 p.m. and you get off at 5 p.m. What would you do if you got an inquiry at 4.55 p.m. that you knew was gonna take you 15 to 20 minutes? Would you just go ahead and knock it out and maybe stay a little bit longer? Or would you say, you know what, let me just curtain it and I'll get it up in the morning. So that lets me know the kind of core values that they operate with, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that, but then I think that one of the biggest mistakes that we made was thinking that hiring more people meant that we were operating a better business. And that was just a very bad assumption to make. So what we did was, we got a ton of orders and then we like, we need to hire a ton of people to solve the problem of the orders that we have. When in reality, it would have been much more smart for us to get back in the field with the people that we already had, continue to train them to become more efficient because we just wasted so much time hiring 50 to 30 more people and then having to train them and then help them out and all of those things. And um, that just took a massive hit on the business that you know takes a while to recover from, so. Yeah. And I say uh, from our end, from the question is just like, I think that uh, we really worked on our systems a lot. And that was one of the things that I feel like like saved us 
because even with like I feel like we getting the same amount done now with less people. people with less yeah. people than we we had with more people. And for us, I said that uh, we had like a traditional company mindset where we thought that everybody had to be inside a warehouse right. from designer to a marketer to like you know we just like you got to be everybody got to be there right we, yeah. we want me <laughs> we want you know make this thing but it's not even about that it's just about getting the job done yeah um and so we realized it was just that like as we continue to like grow like like our payroll was up to fifty thousand dollars a month yeah like fifty thousand dollars a feeling a month <laughs> like you know what I mean? And, you know, our payroll is half of that now. And we still pay our people um, $15 minimum wage. And they only work from Monday to Thursday. Right. You know, on a four-day a four work week. Nice. So the yeah, whole, can I work for y'all boys, man? What's, a what's whole change. I'm about to ask you the same thing. <laughs> a whole business change right. with less people and still being able to crank out the capacity that we had now. But it was all to those systems because, you know, what we, the same thing that you were saying, like, we could have pushed we were being nice. We, that, that's the best way that I could see it. It wasn't that we wasn't had those. We didn't have those systems in play, but it, all in all, I think that you know, with us being young, we always gave the benefit of the doubt. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, because nice. we want to grow with them, we right. want to grow with them. We want them to see that we're trying to build this thing, and we're not just like you know, just come in here, get your job done, and then we out. Right. Which most of the jobs that you're probably working at are. Mm-hmm. But that wasn't what we wanted to be, especially building this company. Right. And so uh, I feel like that now that we, you know, had to make hard changes as far as like, like when the Iowa hit, that, that hit, that affected everybody. Mm-hmm. And so we, you know, we started to focus more into our own database. Right. And we realized that, you know, instead of, you know, spending so much money, you know, externally, we could, you know, save this money. And then we realized that a lot of the stuff that we was doing, we really didn't need. And then we also had made the transition to, you know, and, and still going back, we had got away from the volume mm. because, you know, building your business up on the volume and not now having the systems that we have, you can do it. Right. But we were learning. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so you have a little bit of margin for yeah. error when you're doing those things as far as like doing a lot of overselling. As far as like we had eight customer service reps in-house right. mm-hmm. cranking out emails all day. every you know all day when you know now you know we outsource because we get enough emails where we could just outsource. Right. <laughs> We we're, were probably spending five to six thousand dollars just on that team. Right. You know, I just got a bill yesterday. It was two thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> and you have a less, you know, of a, you know, focusing on making sure that these people are doing exactly the things that you need them to do. Right. Um. So it was a lot of just things that we wasn't, you know, making those transitions mm-hmm. fast enough. Right. Uh, to continue to grow the business. Yeah. But the business forced us yeah. to make those changes, and now like you know. We able to operate just more effectively than what we when we were doing than we were just saying like just just because more work coming in and getting more people that don't necessarily mean that like we need to figure out probably getting a box from here to there can solve one person right, right? you know like if you could figure out how to get this box done from yeah, the time that it get into the time that it get out in your mind you think you can get more people to get it done faster mm-hmm. but it's really the operation that you have set up mm-hmm. that can actually get the work done faster yeah. to create a, a better result for yourself. Yep. So like that's what we really had dialed into yep. and allowed us to make our business better. And then once let's just like once this time happens, so you I'm pretty sure y'all got to that point. So when you like, man, we only keeping the things that's making us money. Yeah. Like making us money. Yeah. It's the only people that's gonna stay around. <laughs> and then we come and it's just like, you know, some things is adding more problems than, exactly. it, than it's helping as far as that's what you here for to yeah. figure that out. So if See, I gotta figure it out. No, I get no. <laughs> then it's like, bro, I'm paying, I'm paying you to figure out this problem, but I'm having to come figure it out. And I'm having to pay to also figure it out too. So I'm losing in both both ways. So I know I get it a thousand percent. Um the only other thing I'm thinking about when you're talking about that in general is oh it's just such a tough conversation bro Mm -hmm. honestly because like i remember having all of these people and then the business is gonna like it's gonna force you to make a decision like you said and i was like bro we had 30 employees and i remember talking to my consultant that was at coach and whatnot he was like justin bro you don't have enough money to make these dumb decisions that you're making right now he said this is the first thing i would do if i were you 
go look at what everyone's doing. And if they don't contribute to shipping packages out or making you money, they need to go right now because you don't have enough money to, you're bleeding too fast yes. to be able to, to support this. So that was the first thing, the first decision that we had to make. And that was a tough one because then you get into the conversations of like, oh, this is like family and this is like friends and this is like, man, and it's like, but if I don't make this decision then the business is not gonna be able to move forward any longer. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one big one. And I think the other thing that he had really made me do that really opened my eyes was he said, all right, if you feel bad about it, cool. Let's send out a survey to everybody that works in the company. And I want you to just ask very general questions. What's your name? What do you do here? What do you want to do here? What do you like about working here? What do you not like about working here? And one question he had us throw in was, how do you make us money? How do you make Support Black Colleges money? And I was like, that's really interesting. So when we sent that question out to everyone and we got the answers back, I realized that 90 to 95 percent of people that work for us didn't even know how to articulate how they helped us make money to actually sustain the business. Mm -hmm. And once I realized that, I felt a little bit less bad about like, all right, I need to make these decisions. You don't even know how you help us anyways. Let me just move forward and, you know, do what I had to do. And that's how we were able to stay alive during those time periods of what you know, you're sharing right now. So yeah. mm -hmm. that was some things that helped us out a ton. Yeah. It, it, and uh, I think this was probably the first time we shared. Like it was tough for us. We were saying off camera like we had. Like growing at that rate, like we ain't, we wasn't hiring, we wasn't firing. Like we had created the systems to allow that to happen. You know, even when now you got fifty people, we needed a we needed a HR um, department so much that way we where we were like you know giving out the HR manager had an assistant right. and I didn't have an assistant, right. manager had that, an assistant. because That's crazy. you know because the turn it was you know the turn we was turning over you still need yeah. people hired you, you know you running payroll for this many people so every all the paperwork got to be straight once you get the 50 people you got new rules in place right. like, yeah, like you know like <laughs> you got new rules like everybody that's that's on salary got to be at a, 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 a statewide minimum they yeah. got a state minimum salary right. amount so it was just so much that started to just, you know, uh, you know, as the business grew, we had to continue to level ourselves, ourselves too. Right. And uh, like literally, like I said, we realized that thing. When it was time, when these difficult times happened, you start thinking about ways of making things more efficient rather than mm -hmm. doing it from the start. Right. So like we were already burning out, you know, five, six thousand dollars just in the HR department, right. and hiring, firing and managing the team issues. Yeah. That way, you know, just making sure everything is just like if because this is what we ran into. If 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 when when you when you're growing and somebody have a complaint, they can't come, they're not gonna come directly to no, Justin and, and be like, Justin, I feel like you're, you know, you're you too tough on right, me. Yeah. So you have to have some type of department or somebody that's designated, mm -hmm. you know, to at least be able to be that that yeah. mediator in between yeah. in between that point. Mm -hmm. And so we know that we need these things, but we don't know. We just like, okay, well, how, you know, how much how? do HR? Yeah, you know, right. We just paying for it yeah. all. We just hire it. Like, yeah. Bring them in there. Yeah. <laughs> and then we, you know, yeah. And then it's like the college right there. So we in our mind, like, let's just, you know, this this uh, a per perfect person. They go, they want to be an HR. Right. So I'm like, okay, well, we need an HR. You know, then it's just like, we we not even like thinking or, or slowly mm -hmm. getting things involved. We just automatically doing it. Yeah. Automatically just changing. Just the money was there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Automatically right. changing people pay from, you know, basically help, you know, hourly mm -hmm. the salary and not like really noticing what it was doing to the business. Yeah, because yeah. it's it's difficult too, because especially in the physical product business, it's so much in and out is of cash. It's a cash flow business. It's is so it difficult. <laughs> so if you don't truly understand like, bro, this is my cost of goods sold. This is like, I need to have these manufacturers on net 30s, et cetera. Especially when you're doing like big box retail and urban outfitters, whoever, they not paying you till net 30, net 60, but you hiring as if you getting your money right then and there. So it's tough making those decisions. And I think that that's another thing you were just talking about earlier, Marlon, was like, one thing that I see new brand owners don't do is that they don't justify the reasons why they do specific things. So I remember sitting back when we were in a tough spot and I'm like, all right, all of these channels that we got, we need to look at all the channels that we're utilizing, which one is making us the most money? Because what I realized was we was dedicating most of our time towards growing on Instagram and all of these social media platforms. But in reality, all the money we was making was coming from our email and text message marketing. Mm. So I'm like, all right, we're allocating 90% of our resources to going viral on social media. 
when 90% of our revenue is coming from email and text. That makes no sense. So why don't we draw back where we're putting these different inputs in and then sh shovel them over to the place that's actually making money. So I think that a lot of people don't do that either, bro. It's crazy because look, I, and he probably gonna watch this video, but we had I had, I had a student, I got I hopped on the call with him, right? Mm. And um, he had just bought some t-shirts and he had bought Shaka Wat tees. Yeah. It was like, it cost him like seven to $10 a shirt. And he was like, I bought a hundred of them. And I was like, damn, how much you spent? He was like, I think it was like, let's just say $8 a shirt. He said he spent $800. I was like, what made you want to get like Shaka tees? Like you never ordered Shaka tees. Like what made you want to get that? Cause I want a new look. I want to, I want to, I want to have that heavyweight feel. I want to charge more. I'm like, all right, what shirt you was using before that? He was like all style, you know, some gilding, mm -hmm. which is not even half, less than half the right. cost of that shirt. <laughs> I'm like, bro, you could have got almost 300 shirts for the same amount you spent at $800. What was the point of you getting $8 tees just because you want to be cool? Right. And I'm like, cool don't make money. Right. Like, like, <laughs> like you switch your whole business model. You went away from what's working because you want to please somebody else that don't even know about your business. Right. But you know what that's saying, Nick? That, <laughs> like, that that person doesn't know about They the made business. the decision right. for the business, but they didn't even know what they was making the decision for. And know. like when I explained it to him, he was just like, bro, like I went so far away from myself with making that decision. And like that one thing has gonna prohibit him from getting his next right. thousand right. t-shirts. Now you gotta basically start yeah. all the way over. So like exactly what we saying is like, that's the reason why we stay in our lane. Right. That's the reason why we stick to our $10, $15, $20 tees because that's our business model. Right. Just because Justin selling yeah. 40 tees, $4 tees don't make Nick and Marlon go say, yo, tomorrow I'm waking up selling $40 shirts. It's true. This is the big, bro. This is arguably the biggest lesson that I learned in this business. I swear to you. I was doing everything based on what I thought was the right thing to do. What I felt was cool. What I felt looked right. Oh, I want to build a big business. Let's go get an 8,000 square foot warehouse. Let's start getting employees in there. That's what you're supposed to do when you're building a biz business. I'm like, oh, we need to continue hiring. Are we getting more orders? I, that's what I thought was happening. But what I realized was is that I was building a business that I didn't even like. Like I, I resented the business because my skill set is very clear. I'm good with content. I'm good with marketing. I'm good with strategy. I'm good with things of that nature. But why am I running a 8,000 square foot warehouse with four seamstresses and 30 employees folding, bagging, and et cetera with t-shirts. It's not who I am. So I ended up building what I call is you built a life around your business rather than a business around your life. And what I think most people need to do when they're first starting is look at all the different models that are out there. Print on demand, drop shipping, doing it yourself. There's a ton of different ways to make money in this business. Yes. The first thing you got to do is step back and be like, what type of entrepreneur am I? or which type of entrepreneur do I wanna be and which business model fits the skill sets that I have so that I can build a business that I truly like and it fits around the life that I see for myself rather than like, oh, let me just go do this because it's cool and that's what seems like is the right thing because then you end up building a business, it might grow, but then you resent it because it's not what you wanna do and then you don't, you end up hating the baby that you got and then you're trying to figure out, man, how can I get rid of this, man? Like what, what I gotta do, but then, you come to that point of where it's like, all right, I'm either gonna get rid of this or I'm gonna become the person or change the whole entire business model, but it gets real painful when it's so big and you gotta make that switch. Yo, so that's the, bro, that's and, the biggest thing. everything thing. you're talking about is the same thing that we talk about. The output of the business, the results that you get out the business is gonna be the input of yourself. Yep. Like, like you are the person that runs the business. Like we talk about, the, the number one thing that we teach is how to transform yourself. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I got a Shopify store, you got a Shopify store, they got a Shopify <laughs> store, they that Shopify store might make a thousand a month. My Shopify store may, may, might make 5,000 a month. Your yeah. Shopify store might make a hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. It's because of the person that is running the business, period. Nope. Nothing else. It. I can, it's, it's no app I can give you that's going to make you millions of dollars. Right. It's all about the person that's running the business. Hey, I hope y'all enjoying this video. Hey, make yeah. sure you like, subscribe to the channel, run us up. Yeah. Hey, who gave you the most game? I think I got, I think I beat Justin on this one. I don't one. know about that I think that I beat one, Justin brother. on this one. Uh, 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 All right, we're going to be giving away 100 free t-shirts. Make sure you like, subscribe to the channel, run us up. Hey, we not done. We got a few more gems before we get out of here. All right, so I, I, I think that uh,
this is a big thing that's growing your brand, like culture. Because mm-hmm. really, um, when you can you speak about how you guys create, how you create a culture around your brand yeah. to allow people to even be able to want to be Buy to you. work for yeah. you? Because yeah. a lot of people can't even get help. Right. They're like, I'm running my brand, I'm doing what I need to do, but I can't, I don't, I don't have nobody to help me out. Yeah. And the reason why they don't sometimes have people to help them out because others haven't bought in yeah. to what they're selling or right. bought into the company or bought into the culture that they have created. Um, what were some of those things that y'all did to create yeah. company culture? That's good. I, I think that w- now that I'm looking at it from like having been through it after is it was a very key decision that we made was to build the culture first and then kind of start monetizing it after. So Mm -hmm. for us, we became like a hub for news, for black colleges, black excellence, et cetera. And then we was like, hey, we kind of like sell t-shirts too. So we put a lot of emphasis on doing that. But I think that it goes back into the self-awareness piece too, because there's so many different ways to do that. If I'm the type of like, you know, I'm the avant-garde Virgil Abloh type of person, then I have to post content in a specific way to be able to portray that. If I'm just a artist, like, you know, a friend like Kodan or someone like that, that they do art, it's like, you have to do it that way and gain notoriety. But the biggest thing that I can, that I look at now, when you're thinking of it at like a way higher level, in my opinion, is the personal brand that's also surrounding the business too. Because if you think about it, the biggest businesses, Amazon, Twitter, or like, you know, Elon Musk, Tesla, et cetera, people want to work for Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. So how can I build myself up and build the business around myself too, to where people want to work for me, no matter where I'm at. So at first I was thinking about it of what type of content do I need to make that's going to attract the right people that will then want to make them work for me. Now I think about it as, all right, can I build myself up as a big enough brand or business to where no matter what I do, people want will want to come and work with me because of who I am. So that's just kind of a subtle shift that I made. That's, hey, that, you know. that's big right there. I like that. It's a because it's a it's a it's a new way of doing business. Like yeah. the ways that we was doing business five six years ago is very very different. Now that it's like after COVID, basically. Think about it like this too. Me and Amir was just talking about this the other day. You got Jeff Bezos and you got like Mr. Beast, right? Or like Coca Cola and Mr. Beast. Me personally, I'd rather work for Mr. Beast than Coca Cola. <laughs> Not because he built a strong culture around his beverages and this and that. It's like no, you're Mr. Beast. I want to work and learn from you because you're one of the best in the business doing it. So I think that businesses in general are shifting more so towards like creator culture and whatnot, rather than just like traditional long standing business. Because you even look at the Mr. Beast example. Me and Amir was arguing about it. I'm like, bro. You go into a Target or whatever, they got Feastables and they got Hershey's. Like people are making a decision on whether they want to inv- buy and invest in Hershey's rather than Feastables. And then also Mr. Beast is a creator uh, that is uh, able to bring people that weren't already going to come to the store to buy Hershey's or Feastables to now come into the store. So you're increasing the bottom line of like a Walmart or a Target or whatever. So when you go into those buying conversations and they're debating, do I let Hershey's get this shelf space or do I let Mr. Beast and Feastables get it? Well, Mr. Beast brings people that were already gonna buy Hershey's and people that weren't even gonna come to the store anyway. So I'd rather make that decision. Mm. So it's not about the culture or the brand or the longevity, it's about can you increase the bottom line for all of these partners yep. that you have? Yep. And the reason that Mr. Beast is able to do that is because of who he is and not because of, you know, the brand that he's built, even though he's art, he's building a personal brand to himself yeah, too. Yeah, building a personal brand. So you, man, you got, you got me about to focus on that person. You got me, you got me <laughs> about to go run it up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> look, bro, because we, we didn't did so many social media pages that we just kind of shifted our focus right. from focusing on ourselves to just building these businesses, but you, bro, you got me over here already right now. I'm about to go run this content. <laughs> I'm about to go, hold on, hold on. I'm about to go hit one of these. <laughs> <It's stupid>. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Where if, y'all enjoy this, if y'all enjoying this, make sure y'all drop a comment. Hey, Justin, do you got anything you want you want to let the viewers know before you get up out of here? No, brother. I'm just grateful to be able to be here with you guys and hey, share the hey, moment. This, this the first hey, wedding home you, sit down. Oh, sure. Uh, Facebook. No, not Facebook. Twitter. Twitter. What is my Twitter? It doesn't matter. Threads now. I don't know what's going on no more. Uh, look, Justin P. Look, on Justin everything. P. Justin P. On Threads. Justin P. On Instagram and TikTok is Ecom Justin P. Ecom Justin go. P. Hey, this the, this the first long sit down, but hey, this ain't gonna be the last one, right? Nah, of yeah. course not. Y'all heard of this on video round two coming soon.
Appreciate you. Appreciate y'all so much. I'm Marlon Wise Corner and CEO of World Envision. Yeah, I'm Nicholas Clark Corner, designer of World Envision, and we out. Oh,